Hi there. As mentioned, my name is Becky. Um, I come from an organization called the Engine Room, which is, um, uh, I work with colleagues on um, almost every continent. Um, I myself am based in Amsterdam, uh, and I'm very happy to be in Berlin today. Um, and I want to take you through a project that we finished up recently, uh, which was commissioned by uh, Mozilla, Ariadna, and the Ford Foundation. Um, uh, and the aim there was to understand how do digital rights, climate justice, and environmental justice intersect? Um, what kind of opportunities exist to support the work that's already in that space, as well as to grow work that is exploring connections between movements and sectors? And to kind of wayfind a little bit about um, uh, how we kind of see and envision future collaboration. Um, a note about uh, who uh, worked on this research. Uh, I led the research project. Uh, I worked together with my team and with um, uh, an anthropologist named Madhuri Karik, who studies uh, land rights defense um, in India. Um, so uh, it was a really wonderful opportunity to work on this uh, and truly a collaborative uh, 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 project. move on. Um, and our report was released recently um, in July, actually. Uh, you can check it out uh, at the link there. I also uh, included a link in the program of Bits and Bomb um, in case that's a little bit of an unwieldy URL to type into your device right now. So when I'm talking about digital rights, what do I mean? Um, I, I think this conference is really fascinating because the uh, framing is obviously digitalization and sustainability. So that's a pretty broad frame. Um, when we're talking about digital rights, I feel like we're then honing in on one particular um, set of practices, ideas, beliefs, and systems to address what digitalization means for our society and for different groups of people. Um, how do we make sure that it respects human rights, uh, technologies, um, internet governance, um, and a lot of traditional areas there include, for example, digital security, privacy, data protection, uh, in recent years, automated decision making, and more. So the field of digital rights is always expanding, but it's a particular orientation towards this idea of digitalization. The same goes for climate justice and environmental justice. So, as uh, other speakers today have already pointed out, um, sustainability, it can't necessarily be conflated with environmental or climate justice. Climate justice and environmental justice have very particular histories as movements. Environmental justice is older. Um, it came about in conjunction with social justice and civil rights groups who were fighting against um, uh, environmental racism and trying to um, uh, bring justice to, uh, to uh, supply, supply chains and uh, labor rights and a number of different um, issues that intersect in, in important and, uh, 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 ways. Uh, climate justice is a slightly newer term. It particularly concerns itself with the climate crisis ongoing, which has been building up for many centuries, as people have noted today. It's entwined with questions of colonialism, and it seeks distributive justice and reparations for parts of the world which are feeling the effects of climate change, some much more acutely already than others. So in um, mapping the intersections of, of climate justice and environmental rights, I think what we heard uh, from the people we spoke to, because this was qualitative research and it involved um, having conversations with a very diverse uh, group of people, that you know this is a huge space. It's not just one space, it's many spaces. And it's important to know the limits of your own worldview when you're looking for connections between sectors and thinking how people can collaborate. Uh, who did we speak to, specifically? 
Uh, we held a number of community calls um, with uh, practitioners coming both from digital rights and more on the climate and environmental side. Uh, we spoke with uh, funders because this was a, a funder commissioned project to understand how um, uh, funders can support uh, these uh, sectors. Um, and we held 20 interviews uh, with practitioners and researchers um, just to give you a small example of who we spoke to. This involved people working on the questions of AI in relation to precision agriculture, um, algorithmic disinformation um, as it perpetuates um, uh, uh, climate disinformation, um, environmental data specialists who work on a community level, people focused on a sustainable internet and decarbonizing the internet, environmental lawyers, divestment campaigners. So this is really um, a very wide cross section of people, but who are all very passionate about moving forward on, on climate justice. And in our research, we uh, identified a number of cross-cutting themes, and I'll just take you through a few today. Um, the first is uh, uh, something that has come up a lot today already, the question of growth and continuous expansion. Um, what does it mean, basically, to continue to pursue an economy based on uh, growth when we know that our planet cannot necessarily support it? Uh, this was a theme that came up over and over, both in discussions with uh, people coming from climate and environment, as well as digital rights. And there, a lot of um, frameworks, very generative and controversial frameworks came up uh, in thinking about alternatives to what we think of today as um, the kind of economic growth system that we're used to. This includes degrowth, post-growth, post-extractivism. Um, and indeed, people feel very differently about these uh, ideas of what it might mean to have a completely different kind of economy. We didn't find any agreement there. Uh, but what's clear is that uh, it's a really generative area of thinking and discussion right now. The next one is that extraction is a theme um, that really cuts across discussions of technology currently and environment and climate. Extraction is one of these frames that um, when we think of it in relation to digital rights, we might be talking about the uh, data, um, uh, big data mo uh, business models of big tech firms that are premised on continued surveillance, analysis, uh, and often a lot of this done without the consent of, of data subjects. And on the other side, in relation to climate, we think of um, mineral extraction uh, um, and um, all of the kinds of extraction that have led up to this day and to the economy that we have now. And at the intersection of these fields, we see concerns around data centers and how they use water how they contribute to desertification of certain areas of the world. We, uh, one example that comes up a lot is about AI and how AI is actually used to help extract uh, oil more efficiently. So this is extraction and extractivism as a frame that unites these very different movements. And the third one is this idea that we have to grow the commons as it relates to alternative kinds of platforms, shared resources, um, and on the environmental and climate side, this has long been discussed as a way of thinking about conservationism. And on the digital rights side, with those who we spoke to, it was really about commoning technology and um, thinking about alternatives to Facebook, et cetera. So in relation to these themes, we also, in our uh, research, um, wanted to identify some key areas uh, related to particular issues um, that uh, um, have come up over and over and where people really expressed a sense of risk, concern, but also opportunity uh, for new work. 
The first is around uh, sustainable internet and technology. Um, in our research, we surveyed a number of different initiatives, uh, both uh, corporate and nonprofit, uh, tackling sustainability currently. And um, there, really, the uh, focus we saw was um, transitioning infrastructure to renewable energy sources and increasing uh, the efficiency of technical infrastructure. When it comes to big tech firms, um, we've seen that in the last few years, a number of big promises have been made around sustainability. And at the same time, a lot of greenwashing. So, um, People who we spoke to from across these fields expressed concern with the fact that some of the um, tool sets that technologists and companies currently rely on for sustainability um, aren't necessarily addressing the root cause of the problem. So one, for example, uh, one example would be carbon offsets. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that oftentimes carbon offsets don't work as intended or actually are displacing harm onto um, ecologies and communities that they are intended to help protect. In this arena, um, we also saw a number of areas that deserve support and where a lot of really important work is already happening. In terms of challenging big tech, there are efforts to push for greater transparency and accountability, in terms of sustainability plans. Um, we also see a number of social justice groups that are, are already um, pushing and challenging big tech companies, but which don't necessarily fit neatly within to the digital rights uh, sphere. And here I'm talking about groups like Amazon Employees um, for Climate Justice, uh, Athena Coalition, et cetera. There are many of, of groups already uh, working on this. Another issue is uh, where there's much opportunity is in promoting circular uh, approaches to technology, advancing the right to repair, um, and uh, fighting against the planned obsolescence that has uh, become uh, baked into a lot of big tech business models. We also saw a really interesting area of inspiration around the fossil fuel divestment movement, which has had many victories in recent years with um, managing to get institutions with lots of money to take their money out of investments in polluting companies, in oil companies, and in companies that have been implicated in environmental damage. So there are some interesting questions to think about in terms of how can divestment be an inspiration for the digital rights movement, which is so concerned with big tech and harms created by big companies uh, um, and there, yeah, there seems to be a lot of opportunity there to think about this. Um, I'm going to move on to our, our next issue of cross-cutting concern. Um, for, for many years now, the uh, digital rights movement has um, done very important work uh, pushing for more uh, internet access and um, um, pushing for the accessibility of technology. And here we wanted to uh, call attention to the fact that um, this actually remains a persistent problem, that um, even though so much work has been done to bring more people online, so to speak, um, there is so much more work to be done in terms of infrastructure and equity. And on that front, um, uh, yeah, we see uh, that um, some, some of the interesting projects we surveyed include um, creating inclusive new kinds of platforms to teach literacy and um, community networks, which I know have already been discussed today. So these are a couple of the important areas of work that continue on this, uh, even as the, the problems that we're facing and the crises that we're facing change. Another area of persistent concern is around digital safety and security uh, for movements. And here, um, we really saw that uh, the current priorities are around thinking about security not just as something that an individual is responsible for on their computer, but about something at a community level, about infrastructures that support people to work together, not just in organizations or in isolation, 
but across decentralized networks. Because when we think of the climate movements and environmental movements that are most active today, they often don't fit into traditional ideas of, of organizations and therefore don't fit into a traditional IT infrastructure either. Um, and so on that front, um, it's, um, it's very important to think about digital security in terms of how you can transition from um, uh, ad hoc support to thinking at a systemic and long-term uh, perspective for environmental and climate groups. Another issue area of cross-cutting concern is about the use of data. Um, what we looked at was a number of different initiatives, um, and we're talking about um, uh, environmental data groups who have been active for over a decade, collecting data about the ecosystem, tracking changes. Um, but on the other hand, much more recent developments where actually um, commercial actors come in and want to harness the data um, collected by uh, communities and uh, to use it uh, to be able to predict future climate events, um, uh, basically future harms related to uh, climate and environment. And here, uh, a lot of the concern came up around questions of uh, just data governance. Um, what does it mean when a, a corporate actor from another country comes into a local context and says, oh, the data you've collected on the, your local ecosystem is so valuable, we want to use it now to create a product or to drive our intelligence in a certain area. And so here, one of the big opportunities that we identified was the need to connect data governance uh, discussions in the digital rights realm with data governance discussions that have actually been happening for quite a long time now in relation to indigenous data sovereignty and local decentralized approaches to data stewardship. Another uh, natural um, area for the digital rights sphere, which came up a lot in our interviews, was the need to challenge um, the data practices of smart cities and living labs where, again, a lot of data is being collected from citizens with the idea that there is citizen participation. But then, for example, not a lot happens with that data down the line. And there is a sense that perhaps the participation didn't lead to the democratic outcome that people wanted. So um, that connects to concerns with, uh, again, commercial extractive um, uh, data governance models. And a final area that I'll touch on today is around migration justice and border technology. In this area, we see currently that a number of different states um, have uh, uh, been excited to embrace um, AI data-driven technologies to, with more precision, track migration patterns, to track people on the move, and to um, uh, preempt uh, border crossings in many cases by people who should have a right to cross a border. And in this area, what people really identified as important areas to grow is to really support the number of coalitions that already exist um, that are focused on bringing more justice to border technology, to dismantling and ab abolishing border technology and um, engaging in strategic litigation uh, that, uh, to challenge the kinds of non-transparent da data practices that come into play. So these are a number of areas that we identified, and the goal of our research was to inform uh, uh, people who want to fund this space and um, uh, support and grow uh, these areas. So I will very quickly take you through our recommendations on that front, but then I want to open up the discussion um, uh, back to the many opportunities that I have already identified, which, um, which were highlighted by the movements and uh, uh, practitioners that we spoke to. The first is that um, funding institutions, if they are interested in, in climate and environment, um, this is a really ripe moment for them to actually 
take stock of their strategies of investment and perhaps um, see how the divestment movement can be inspiring on that front to consider where to take uh, their money out and where it can be reinvested. And another big priority in terms of funding strategies that meet movements and communities where they are is finding a way to effectively support informal networks and small groups, the kind that often don't have the resources to apply for funding, but who need it very badly and are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the climate movement. Another area uh, or avenue to explore is about helping um, uh, civil society scale up and have more resources to, to focus on these issues because many of the digital rights practitioners who we spoke to felt, yes, the climate crisis is super crucial, but I don't know how to bring it into my organizational strategy because at the moment we're already strapped and we're trying to put out all of these different fires already. So how do we make this a part of our work? So for that reason, um, we recommended um, that there um, be support for many more collaborative projects um, and chances to develop a climate-related strategy. Here's a really crucial one, I think, for uh, the tech infrastructure-focused people, if there are any in this room today. Um, the issue of maintenance. Uh, Maintenance is an issue that came up over and over with the people who we spoke to. I'll give you a couple of examples. One area around maintenance is with regards to environmental data and data collection. At the moment, um, the field and the resources and infrastructures available for this kind of data collection are often in commercial hands. And again, um, relying on extractive data business models. There are many groups in the world who want to create their own alternative infrastructure and indeed have already, which is a great achievement. But maintaining that over a year, two years, three years becomes exponentially more difficult and finding funding to support that also does. So we think that supporting the maintenance of these kinds of community processes is actually essential in that regard. Another example I'll give, this is perhaps a more obvious one, is in relation to digital security and uh, defense for movements. Um, I think the technically focused security people in this audience will say immediately that uh, security advice will become obsolete before you know it. Well, some security problems remain the same and others change all the time. And so in order to really effectively support an organization, again, we come to this word, the M word, maintenance. Um, I think I'm going to end there. There are many more recommendations that you can explore in this report. There's many uh, areas where we highlight a lot of important work already happening at the intersections of digital rights and climate justice. So I invite you to explore it again here. And please feel free to write to me, tweet at me, and check out our work because we really want to continue working on climate and environmental issues. So thank you so much. Okay. A big thanks to um, Becky um, and the uh, team at Engine Room. Um, if there's any questions, uh, this is the time to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Becky, for your presentation. I would like to ask you the role of the energy sources, I mean the fossil fuel, and uh, in the climate justice of the digitalization. Uh, thank you for, for your question. Uh, let me know if I understood this correctly. Um, it's, uh, you're interested in energy sources? And the, right, the role that they play uh, in relation to climate and digital rights. Yeah, um, that's a really essential topic, absolutely. I think one place where that came up a lot in our research, um, I'll take you back to where uh, we investigated the big tech practices at the moment and the um, 
sustainability transition and sustainability plans that they've um, been uh, uh, putting in action in recent years. What we saw there is that there's a lot of emphasis on this idea that they are moving to renewable energy. Um, and um, uh, while this is a really laudable and important effort to even move in that direction, we also saw a lot of uh, criticism from climate justice advocates and from people who are, have been taking big tech to task who say that renewable energy doesn't necessarily mean sustainable energy. And if, it's, uh, if it continues to um, exist within this framework of always creating larger business models, using more data, analyzing more data, using more AI, then that renewable energy runs out very quickly. So um, even with renewable energy, it has to be coupled with uh, new kinds of ideas about uh, the economy and what it means to, uh, to be a business that handles data. Yeah. Yeah, hi, um, thank you so much for the input. Um, I'm just curious, in the report you sometimes touched a bit about on feminism also, like on feminist initiatives at least, and I was just curious, do you have any thoughts on how this angle can come into it, or if we are at the moment still trying to map out this intersection and it gets too complicated? I don't know, I'm a bit struggling with this, so I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, yeah, feminism is a, a central uh, part to um, efforts to enact a, a just transition, uh, so a just societal transition to, uh, to greater sustainability. Um, one example of a feminist framework working on this is the uh, feminist uh, New Deal. Um, so that's a coalition of um, explicitly feminist actors who, uh, who do map out the importance of feminism in thinking through questions of colonialism, extractivism, um, environmental racism, and how, what, what this means for the kinds of climate solutions that we, uh, we as a society, uh, decide to invest in. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thanks for the presentation. You mentioned that you had only six months to put together the report, which is still like mind blowing to me. So what if you had like another six months or a year? Like what are the topics that you would like to do some more deep dives? What were things that you discovered and didn't have time to like do too much research or interviews on? And that's a great question, thank you. <laughs> Um, I think um, what's really uh, interesting is the meta process of this research because we were, we were so thankful to have the chance to work on this um, and obviously we spent these months interviewing lots of really um, um, amazing people doing important work. For us this was also, <laughs> you know, we talk about the importance of organizational strategies beginning to address climate more explicitly. I think that for the engine room is becoming a priority as well, to think about climate and how it fits into the strategy. Um, so I, I think there's so many important areas that I touched on, like big tech practices, um, uh, supporting, for example, labor movements that are currently taking big tech to task. Um, I think there's a lot of research, a lot of organizing <laughs> that, that, uh, that is happening and that needs to be supported to happen more. I think um, one particular area we've discussed uh, within the organization is uh, the engine room has a long-standing line of work around what it calls responsible data. And um, this is kind of a constellation of work um, focused on exploring more just data governance uh, models. And um, it's focused a lot on the humanitarian and development sector in the past. And I think now with all of the, the new kind of round of AI for good projects in relation to climate and um, environment, 
this is an important moment to think about how responsible data uh, principles, for example, can play a role in thinking, thinking questions through around AI and climate. So that's just one example, but yeah, thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, then this is a good time to um, end the talk. Let's have another big round of applause for um, Becky and the team at en the Engine Room. <laughs>